Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Elise Adler, Director of Events for Parnassus Books, and we are thrilled to share tonight's event featuring author, fantastic author who we love, Alexandria Bellaflor. She is here to celebrate her new book, Count Your Lucky Stars. Now, just as a reminder, you can purchase that book, Count Your Lucky Stars, with signed book plates from Parnassus. So we're going to go ahead and put the link in Facebook and in YouTube and just click on that link and you can order your copies. Also tonight, you can put in that same area in the chat and comments, you can put questions. Alexandria has agreed to answer questions as best she can throughout the course of the evening. So go ahead and feel free to ask. Now we're especially thrilled because tonight, Alexandria is in conversation with fellow fabulous author, Meryl Wilsner. So I'm so thrilled to turn it over to Alexandria and Meryl. Hello, hello, how are you doing? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Alexandria, congratulations. You had oh. your book published yesterday. How are you doing? I am doing well. Um, I got a little bit more sleep last night than I, I have in a long time. Um, but I'm, I'm just very excited that Count Your Lucky Stars is out in the world. And yeah, so I'm kind of on cloud nine right now. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. I bet. It sounds thrilling. This is the third of, you know, sort of, it's not really a trilogy, but the sort of the last book of the series here. Yeah. Um, starting with Written in Your Stars, uh, Written in the Stars and uh, <laughs> Hang the Moon. How do you feel? What's that like having the third book come out? You know, I'm very proud since most of these books were written during the pandemic. So I feel like that was, you know, a, an undertaking, um, you know, writing anytime, but especially in these circumstances. Um, I'm also, you know, it's, it's kind of bittersweet. I'm a little sad to say goodbye to these characters um, that I love so much that I've gotten to know, but, you know, they will live on in my head and in my heart and in these books. Um, I'm happy that they're out in the world that readers can, you know, sharing these stories. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a bittersweet feeling, but more on the sweet side. I, I understand that. And I, I got to say, as someone who has read and loved the book, I think that they're still going to live on for a long, you're still going to hear about them for a very long time as readers uh, get a hold of your books and I hope so. then, Fingers crossed. And <laughs> then reach out to you and yell about how much they love them. I'm sure you get a lot of that coming <laughs> to you. <laughs> Um, you had an in-person launch event last night. Is that right? How did that go? What was yeah. that like? Was that your first one? It was. Yeah, it was my first in-person event outside of um, conferences. I had been to PLA with a bunch of librarians and PNBA with a bunch of indie booksellers in Portland. But it was my first, you know, reader event where I could connect with with readers. And so it was it was really fantastic because as much as I love these virtual events and I love the accessibility that, you know, anybody can be watching this, it's, it's great. Um, but, you know, being able to actually like make eye contact with, you know, people in the audience and know that if I say something hopefully funny, that my jokes are like landing, that people are like, That's always I don't know if anybody's laughing when I'm on Zoom. Um, so that was really special being able to actually connect with readers. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was, daunting in a sense because I've gotten so used to this format but overall I was very very happy about it yeah that sounds that sounds wonderful I can totally understand especially when when you think you're am I being charming am I not being does everyone hate me who knows it's just <laughs> silence out there hopefully exactly. I hopefully we're being charming to everybody who's watching right now I but hope so yes <laughs> I love that you got to really connect you know face to face with with readers and get that experience yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask more um, sort of about the series as a whole, as well as, you know, obviously individually about this book. Um, can you tell us a bit? I feel like this is sort of always a question. I'm sure you've probably said it, answered it a lot, but can you tell us a bit about your process um, in writing and especially in how it may differ, how it differed, you know, from book to book in this series? Yeah, so I, I I sold the books all on proposal back in 2019. So I had all three of the books completely plotted out, well, loosely plotted out, planned. Um, so I knew 
you know, Ellen Darcy's story before I even wrote it. I knew Brandon and Annie's story and I knew loosely Margot and Olivia's story. I knew that, you know, Margot was going to have a second chance romance. Um, so I, having that planned out did allow me to kind of plant little like Easter eggs throughout the books. Um, but it was also a challenge keeping characters consistent throughout all three books. Um, I think that's probably a challenge for any author writing a loosely connected series. Um, so yeah, I had it, I had it planned out, um, but some things took me by surprise. Olivia as a character, you know, I didn't really have her fleshed out. Um, so it was, you know, she's new to readers and she's was new to me. Um, as for my process, I'm a massive plotter, massive plotter, like spreadsheets and like, like Excel spreadsheets and beat sheets and, you know, sticky notes. Like I'm, I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. Jeff from like, um, like uh, always sunny in Philadelphia with like the red string. Yeah, Charlie. And the, yeah. That's me when I'm plotting, I'm like connecting points and probably looking manic to other people. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my process. And escalated throughout making sure I was keeping everybody consistent <laughs> but I, I had bet. <laughs> I bet yeah I I try to be a plotter sometimes and then I have you know the spreadsheets and the sticky notes and the and then I focus only on the spreadsheet and then a little while later I find a sticky note and I'm like oh this solves a problem that I've been working on for like three weeks and it turns out that I already knew the answer I just forgot where I put this, this plot piece so like finding money in your pocket or yeah. something like that it's, it's a nice little surprise you wish it you is. had it earlier exactly you wish you found it earlier but you'll yeah. take it now <laughs> did you you said some of the things surprised you um was there you know try not to be spoilery or anything obviously it just came out but was there anything what was like the biggest change um that from from what you sort of had it loosely plotted out when they were sold to the the final book I would say that the biggest change was, you know, I, I didn't know exactly who was going to be getting married in book, you know, from book one or book two. And so that was kind of a little up in the air for me. I knew that there needed to be a wedding in book three. I knew that I wanted Margot's love interest to be a wedding planner, um, but that was always up in the air. So um, it took me writing Hang the Moon book two to kind of figure out where I was going to go in that direction. Um, I think by now most readers know who got married um, or is getting married, but that epilogue in Count Your Lucky Stars will hopefully also take readers by surprise. Yeah, that I I love this book, so I feel like I'm just going to be smiling like an idiot for a lot of this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I love all all of these books, and I, I was wondering which do you have among the three of them like a favorite character to write, or was one of the three books harder? You said you you know if you had them all sort of loosely plotted, that seems probably very helpful. <laughs> Um, but what, what was, what was one of them harder? Was one of them easier? Was one of them more fun? Anything like that? I would say, so I have a soft spot for Margo. I can't, I can't like choose my very favorite. I always get asked this question. It's very common and I understand. Um, but it's like, you know, like picking between my children, even though it's weird. Cause they're like, they're my age. It's so, like calling them my babies is like weird. <laughs> um, but I do have a very soft spot for Margo. Um, it was writing her book was a challenge because I, you know, I wanted her to have that kind of that prickly exterior, that edge, but without coming across as too like, you know, like aggressive, too much of a chip on her shoulder. So that was something I had to fine tune in revisions, you know, digging into her vulnerable side as the main character, since she had been, you know, such a, a prevalent secondary character. Um, so I would say Count Your Lucky Stars was one of my favorite books to write in the series, but also the hardest book, because I feel like it challenged me on a craft level of really digging into her interiority. Um, so hopefully I hit, you know, a, a happy medium of making her, you know, kind of that like, you know, not quite grump, but just kind of like curmudgeon um, to Olivia's not quite sunshine, but kind of a little bit more like it will work out. <laughs> I, th I think you did a great job. I feel like I also would have to say that I have a, sp a soft spot for Margot. And I don't know if it's like, is that because I read this book most recently? And so it's fresh just in my mind, or I do, I do think you did a, a good job of sort of the, 
yeah, not, not quite the grump, but also not, not, not a grump, either. you know, yeah, just yeah. walking the line pretty, pretty well right, there. Yeah. You, you say uh, in your bio, actually, it says you write lovable grumps and the sunshine characters who bring them to their knees, um, which I adore that, <laughs> that line <laughs> itself. Um, but I wondered, is, is grumpy sunshine your favorite trope to write? Is that, you know, if you had to pick one, would that be what you went with? It's, it's tough. Um, I, I always say this and I said it last night. So if you watched my event last night, you're going to hear me say it again, but like, I'm a, I'm a trope slut. Like I have not met a trope that I don't like in the right hands. Um, I think, you know, the right author can, can, you know, wow me with any trope, but you know, grumpy sunshine, what I love about it is really boils down to opposites attract. And that always does it for me. Um, I love characters who end up taking each other by surprise. Um, I feel like it has some great potential for, you know, comedy, for hijinks, um, watching, you know, kind of the slight grump come out of their shell. Um, the sunshine character kind of also, you know, not, not like, you know, become too grounded, but a little bit more grounded in reality. Um, so it is one of my favorites. Um, if I had to pick a favorite trope, that's so hard. I mean, I, I do love fake dating, um, as seen in Written in the Stars. I, I yeah, any kind of like faux mans. Yeah. First, I'm just yeah, I'm a, I'm a slut for tropes. <laughs> I do when people make me pick. I do like to like to pick something like what the one that I like to go with is I call it idiots to lovers, where it, it takes them a very long time. It takes the characters a very long time to figure anything out. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I like to. It. If you have to pick a favorite, I like to pick something like that, or enemies to lovers, or friends to lovers, something that you can take and then go 10,000 different directions with. So that way it's like, am I really only picking one trope by picking right. this? Let's just- It's kind of cheating. Way. That's why I call <laughs> yeah. like, um, I call it fomance instead of like fake dating so that I can like shoehorn in like marriage of convenience, yeah. like all, all sorts of good stuff. <laughs> I love that. I love that. What are some other tropes um, that you love? M maybe not just writing, but reading as well. Like- Ooh. I, you know, I like relationship and turmoil books, like, like, you know, marriage in trouble, um, kind of tied into that second chance romance aspect. Um, I, I always want to write one of those. I'm always a little nervous um, to do it justice. I feel like that's one of the ones that, you know, I, I will write one day, but it, it feels extra angsty. Um, yeah. But uh, with some like redemption arc qualities, that, that's one that I'm, I'm always eager to read, but you know, I'm not sure if I'm ready to write it. <laughs> yeah. I, I understand that. I feel like it can be sort of hard to pull off and that, mm -hmm. you know, certain people expect a romance to be okay. There's a meet cute. So if you're starting, if you're doing relationship and turmoil, it's like they've done the meet cute. They, maybe exactly. they're married at this point. So exactly. And it can't be like, you know, you've got to redeem whatever went wrong. So yeah that I I I also I like I could talk about tropes I feel like forever like sure. narrowing <laughs> it narrowing it down is actually very very difficult <laughs> um, we do have some um questions from readers we're probably just so that our I'm sorry viewers um just so everyone knows we'll probably leave those more toward the end so we can sort of hit a bunch of them at once so feel free to keep popping them into the um the chat as you watch um, and then Alexandra, what do you hope readers take away from this book? Oh, that is a great question. Um, it's, it's like, a, it's a big question, but it's a great question. Um, I would say, I just, I, I really want with all of my books, readers to take away the concept of, you know, queer joy is something that I really like to hit on in all of my books. Um, I, I probably talk about it like at excess in every interview, every podcast I do, but just the importance of queer joy and that, you know, there's definitely validity in the, the coming out stories and the grappling with self, but I really love writing characters who, who are comfortable with themselves and grappling with other facets of their identity. Um, but just, you know, just being happy. I feel like happiness is extremely underrated. Joy is very underrated, especially in these times. Um, I would say that, you know, 
uh, in Count Your Lucky Stars specifically, also the importance of a variety of different relationships, not just romantic, but also platonic. That was really important for me when writing this book to show that, you know, it's not like romantic relationships reign all over all other types of relationships, um, but the importance of, you know, queer platonic relationships and friendships and, you know, found family. So those are, I guess, some themes I hope that readers take away from it. I like that. Yeah, I don't, I think you do a good job with, with sort of encompassing a lot of different types of, of relationships. It doesn't feel like, in Count Your Lucky Stars, it doesn't feel like either you or any of the characters really put relationships in any form of like hierarchy of like okay well this is the person I'll choose first and then I'll pick this person or anything like that it's really nice nice to see that um and I totally agree about queer joy I am I'm so grateful that there are people who can write dark twisty even tragic queer things and and do them well but it's just not me I I am absolutely a let me write a happily ever after yeah I yeah, I think I those that. stories are so, so important and they have a place and they are so necessary. Um, but for me personally, I, I don't want to, I don't want to focus on tragedy. I want to just, I want to focus on those happily ever afters. Um, but I'm happy that all sorts of queer stories exist. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, in, in wanting to focus on happily ever afters, um, how did you sort of get started in romance, either reading and or writing? Yeah, um, I I came to romance primarily through fan fiction. Same. Um, I, you know, fan fiction and YA novels. I fell in love with um, Twilight when I was a teenager and I got sucked into the vortex of fanfic. And then, you know, I wrote like, like some Buffy fanfic for a while and, you know, just kind of wanting to see some of the, you know, the story lines um, lived out getting very frustrated with like the barrier gaze trope. And so I I just, I fell into like seeing alternative universes. And so I I wrote a lot of fanfic for a very long time. And then I eventually just kind of wanted to try my hand at original work. Um, After I graduated from college, I got sucked into reading romance novels. I just started like eating them up. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so I had like a summer after I graduated and I just was devouring like, you know, Kendall Unlimited books. Um, and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this. It took me a very long time after that point to actually get to, you know, publication, <laughs> but that was kind of my, my journey to romance was YA novels and then fan fiction. I, I totally understand that. I always, I also came through fan fiction. Um, I talk about sort of how you know, a lot of people tend to look down on romance and unfortunately, like I was sort of raised that way as well of like, oh, this is, this is a guilty pleasure or this is trashy or whatever. Right. Um, and so I got into fan fiction and I was only reading romantic fan fiction, yeah. but I didn't have in my head like, oh, this, I'm not supposed to like this. So mm-hmm. I, that's also how I got into romance of just, oh my gosh, just gobbling up romantic fan fiction and then slowly realizing like, oh, I could, I could do this myself with my own yes. stuff too, it turns out. Exactly, yeah. I feel like a lot of us sort of, especially with queer authors, I feel like a lot of queer authors have cut their teeth in fan fiction because that Definitely. was where you were allowed, you know, especially when growing up, where you maybe saw yourself more because um, yeah. there Definitely. weren't as many canon queer stories. Definitely. Yeah, I feel like they were um, safer spaces to a degree, more welcoming spaces, um, with, you know, certain, certain fandoms, other fandoms were very toxic, but, you know, um, some fandoms were more welcoming than others for, you know, kind of like baby queers, basically. Exactly. Um, talking, talking about uh, queer joy and queer stories, um, you did probably see recently the discussion on Twitter about, you know, people outside of communities writing stories within, from within that community, um, and it started with, um, sort of began in terms of MM romance, but FF romance was also discussed. Um, and you touched on this a bit with, with discussing queer joy, but just, you know, why is it so important to you to, uh, you know, write FF, ro- FF specifically romance? Yeah. Um, you know, I think 
for me, the more stories that are out there, the more chance there are of capturing the, the varied queer experiences that do exist. Because no group is a monolith. I feel like that is, you know, a phrase that's kind of you know, said often, but it's very true. So I think it's important to be writing these variety of these queer stories for me, FF, but specifically writing by rap in a variety of different, you know, pairings, um, you know, a bi, you know, L is bi and written in the stars and Darcy is a lesbian um, and hang the moon, Annie's bi, but she gets her happily ever after with Brendan, who is a cis man, but it doesn't, you know, make her any less queer. Absolutely. You know, in... Count Your Lucky Stars, Margo is pan, and Olivia is bi and was once married to a man. So, you know, the, the gender of your partner doesn't define your yourself. So I, th I think it's just important to me to show a variety of different experiences. And that also makes me excited to see how many more books are coming out this year and next year that are slated to come out. Um, so that the burden of representing the queer experience doesn't fall on any one author's shoulders because that's that is an impossible burden to kind of carry or do justice to um, when every lived experience is different yeah absolutely I, I totally agree um, and speaking of of you know other books um, coming out this year or in the coming years do you have any specific ones that you're excited about I feel like I feel like YA sort of moved, has moved more quickly um, than a, adult romance in general, but uh, adult books regarding, you know, queer stories. But I feel like there's really been a pickup um, in traditional publishing of queer stories. And uh, are there some coming out this year that you are looking forward to? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I know later this month, um, Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Herring Blake. I read it. I loved it. Same. I did for that to be out in the world. Um, I recently read your book, Mistakes Were Made, and I absolutely loved it. It was um, very steamy and just, you know, everything I could have hoped for in a rom-com. And so I'm very excited for that to also be out in the world. Um, I, yeah, I just, I can't sing enough praises for that book. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have, I have an arc of um, In the Event of Love by Courtney Kay that I have not yet gotten to because I've it's been good, but I'm very excited to read that. Um, I have an arc of I'm Still Not Over You by Kosa Jackson yeah. out this month as well. Haven't gotten to it, but very excited. Um, oh, I, I read Never Been Kissed. By oh, have you? I haven't read it yet. Yes. Oh my God. It was, it was amazing. I loved it so much. Um, I blurbed it. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, Queerly Beloved by Susie Dumond. I read that. I blurbed that. I loved it. Nice. Um, I That's probably one of my favorite things about being an author is getting books in advance and being able to read them early and shout about them. So yeah, this year is just kind of an embarrassment of riches. Um, so yeah, I'm just very excited about so many books. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree. Of the, of the ones that you listed that I've read, already loved them immediately. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward um, to both the Costa Code Jacksons and um, Timothy, what is his last name? I'm trying um, to- J Janowski, I think, like Janowski. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not saying it wrong, but Janowski, I think. But yeah, that um, Never Been Kissed, I'm really looking forward to. And he has a holiday one coming out as well, right? Yes, um, I'm blanking on the title. I haven't read it, but I'm excited. Oh, yeah, um, so yeah, I am I am also just- so thrilled with the diversity within queer stories that that gets to get get told now and um speaking of steamy steamy queer stories there is a um ff coming out by ruby barrett um called the romance recipe that is like a um a restaurant in a restaurant so it's like a foodie romance with a with a chef and, and someone who owns the restaurant and um i was have read an earlier draft of it and it is not only very steamy, but very wonderful. So that's, that's, that's coming out. Um, I want to say in that's June on my as list. Well. Yeah. I, I haven't read it, but I'm eagerly anticipating it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so speaking of, of steamy romance, you know, as we said earlier, like romance does, I feel like often get looked down upon, but sometimes it feels like it sort of even more so gets looked down upon if there is, if there are sex scenes in it, because somehow that's bad. Um, and I wondered if 
you have come up against any of that? Um, I'm sure you have online, but even, you know, have you come up against that in, in person as well? And what do you say to people who sort of look down on, on romance and especially steamy romance? Yeah, I've definitely come up against, you know, romantic, um, like romance naysayers. And it it's always kind of a, it's a struggle when you're in person online. I'm very much like, you know, romance is amazing. It's a billion dollar industry. But when you're, you know, face to face with somebody, it's a little bit, you know, a little harder. Um, I, I, I've kind of stopped caring if mm-hmm. other people don't want to support romance I'm not going to convert them if they're going to be in that mindset they're in that mindset I'm doing what I do um I think one of my more memorable occurrences was earlier well not earlier this year it's 2022 um was in 2021 I was discussing uh you know the differences between romance and um erotic romance and erotica with a man and he, um, I used the word erotica and he was like, no, we do not call it that. We call it spice. And I feel like that's that TikTok, TikTok trend that we don't want to like use words like erotic and erotica. And so that's a bummer. Yeah. Well, well especially like, you feel free to call, you know, maybe a high heat something, call it spicy, but that, that doesn't replace an entire term for a genre. <laughs> genre. It, it, yeah, it was, it was a little off-putting. Um, but yeah, you know, mostly I just, I try to always sell the merits of romance, but I also have just kind of given up caring about how non-readers of this genre feel about the genre. We are doing just fine. That, that is absolutely the truth. Honestly, that's, that's kind of how I deal with it too, especially writing queer romance. I feel like that almost helps me. People will ask, you know, all like what do you write and I'll be like queer romance and I feel like maybe I say it with a like would you like to fight me um yeah, like, no <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I write queer romance what do you have to say about that hmm? and yeah. no one ever has at this point <laughs> so, so that's good but yeah no I I very much support the just you know what you don't want to read it feel free go live in your sad corner and we're gonna do fine on our own yeah. I I like that a lot um this is a question that, that I have, and also we have uh, from from some viewers, is what is next for you? What, what can you tell us about your next book or your next series? Yeah, um, so I recently sold three more books to Avon HarperCollins Yay. for three more queer rom-coms that I'm very excited about. The first is the fiance farce, and it is a sapphic marriage of convenience romance between a shy indie bookstore owner who is trying to save her independent bookstore um, and a newspaper heiress who moonlights as a romance novel cover model who is in need of a spouse in order to inherit her family's publishing company. And it's a little bit of When a Scott Ties the Knot by Tessa Dare meets the Bachelor 1999 film, not to be confused with the reality series, um, okay. <laughs> with a dash of Cinderella. And so it's, it's you know, I feel like, I hope it's going to live up to the name of being kind of farcical. It's going to be pretty funny, kind of out there, some hijinks, situational humor. It sounds awesome. I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm really loving writing it and loving writing these two new characters, Gemma and Tansy, and I hope that readers will We'll love them too. <laughs> nice, nice. Do yeah. I so I read the um, I guess the book announcement for it when in preparing for this, and I had you know I had been excited for it when it actually got announced the first time, but then rereading, I was like, oh, oh yes, I am very <laughs> excited for this book. So I'm <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it for sure. Um, and then one of the the reader questions along with that, just because this is related, is do you have a what's your process when you first start out with a new idea? That's a question from Anna Collins. My process when I first start out. Um, so I, I definitely kind of, I work with music as a playlist um, to kind of get a general like vibe for what I'm going for. Then I kind of start with a hook. I used to be somebody who started with characters first and then I wound up with very quiet, quiet character driven stories. Um, so now I try to think of like that, that hook that, you know, 
you know, tropey hook. Um, and then I just kind of build off of that and think about what kind of characters would fit into that situation, build those characters out with their, their backgrounds and their flaws and their wounds. Um, yeah. And then I, you know, progress into my beat sheets and my Excel spreadsheets and sticky notes and, you know, red string. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you said you sold another three books. Do you are they all plotted the same way that um, at least loosely plotted? Uh, the second one is the second one is very plotted out, um, full synopsis. It is a romance between a romance novelist and a divorce attorney. Nice. It's going to be a queer MF. Both of the uh, characters are bisexual, and the third book is very very loosely plotted. Um, so I can't really tell you much. Yeah, don't say anything. Don't, <laughs> don't nail anything down so that you yeah. can change that up if you'd like. Um, do you have any, uh, we talked, you know, a bit about uh, other queer romances that are coming out this, this year. Um, but what else are you reading? Are you only reading romance? Do you have any recommendations outside of romance uh, that you've been reading lately? Ooh, I'm really a diehard romance reader, um, but outside of queer romance, I I recently read and loved um, Love at First Sight by Anna Collins. Um, I, I did her launch event um, last month, and I, I love the book. It's also set in Seattle, uh, the Seattle area, and I have also recently read and loved um, Behind the Scenes by Amy Catherine Jones, and that's coming out later this month and it is a very steamy romance that I, I hope readers will be very excited about. Nice and I know I, I had said that we were going to do the um, the questions at the end but you keep like we keep connecting to them so I'm going to grab this question. Um, can you can you tell us about your love for the Pacific Northwest and what about the region uh, made you want to set your world there? Yeah so I, I grew up in the Seattle area. Um, I went to school there. Um, I just, I fell in love with the city when I first moved there. Um, grew up, first born in Florida, then moved to the Pacific Northwest. And it is the region that I consider home, even though I don't live there right now. Um, just, you know, you've got the, the ocean and the mountains and the city and it all just kind of collides and it's where my heart is. I feel like it's very cinematic, um, kind of you know, so many romance films have been set in Seattle. And so I wanted this series to be my, my love letter to the city, in addition to being my love letter to the genre. Um, and it's also just the area that I'm most familiar with. So I feel like I can, I can kind of do that setting justice. Make it feel more real because you know actually what it's like. Right. <laughs> um, again, you sort of, you sort of pulled into this question as well. We have a question of, um, about that, I would love to see all of these movies turn or all of these books turned into movies. Um, what do you think would be like pros and cons of turning these into movies? Which I think is a good question. I feel like we often sort of have questions about turning the books into movies, but I, I don't know that we sort of talk about pros and cons of it. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, most authors would absolutely love to see their work adapted to the screen. I think a movie would be a challenge. Um, based on the number of secondary characters. And I would want to see all of the characters get their, their happily ever afters. So I feel like a series, like a, a three season arc would be ideal. So that, you know, you could get everybody, you that know, would be lovely. ever afters. Um, I feel like that would be the main pitfall. I, you know, I don't have like a ton of world building where I feel like you would have to like slice and dice and lose important information um like some like fantasy series struggle with um but yeah i think i would need a tv series for sure <laughs> i love that that to, to have so that each each book gets its own gets its own season in a tv series i think sounds yeah. Yeah. sounds perfect that's a great way to not have to you know cut out as much yeah. um because you're always gonna have to cut down to to get into a movie so i think a, a tv yeah. series is a great idea <laughs> Um, I also had, um, thrown together a little game that I thought we could play, um, just about your characters and it does, it can be any characters in, in, um, the whole series here, um, it doesn't have to just be, uh, Margot or Olivia. Um, but it's a, a game about which character do you think would be most likely, um, to, I'll give you a variety of things and, and you pick and, 
go into as much detail, I guess, as you would like to um, about uh, why you think they're the answer. Um, and I do just want to remind people to, that they can keep um, popping questions in uh, as well now that I've taken ticked some of them off because because we uh, we went through them. Um, okay, so which character uh, would be most likely to make their significant other learn tic tac dances? <laughs> Oh, I feel like that would be a toss up between Elle or Brendan. I feel like Elle would definitely want to get Darcy on board with doing some TikTok dances. Um, Darcy would definitely humor her after, you know, putting up like, you know, a little bit of a fight, but she would give in eventually. She would, I mean, Darcy would do anything for Elle, so she would, she would give in. Um, Brendan, I think would get all like, yeah, like we got to do this. Like, but I don't think he would just try to get Annie in on it. I think he'd want to like choreograph the whole group. Like we're going to do this group number, like a flash mob style TikTok dance. Um, and it would, it would kind of be a cluster, but, uh, I think they'd have a good time with it. <laughs> yeah, Brendan was my thought and, and your explanation of it, I think is perfect. Exactly. Like, he would just get everybody involved. Yeah. I like that. Which character would be most likely to cheat at board games? Mm. Well, Darcy, Darcy would probably get a little underhanded, but I feel like she wouldn't necessarily cheat. She would figure out how to manipulate the rules <laughs> just enough that nobody could really call her out on it. She would be like, no, it states in, it states in the manual that I can do this. Um, just kind of like skirting the line. Um, Margo would probably definitely like do like a stretch and like look at someone's cards or something or, you know, like mess, mess something up a little bit. Um, so, so Margo or, or Darcy probably. I like that. Yeah. Darcy, Darcy, Darcy wants to win, but isn't necessarily ready to, to go over the line into cheating yeah. at this point. I like that. Yeah. Um, which character, this may or may not be inspired by me as a human being, uh, which character would be most likely to buy way too many candles at Bath and Body Works candle day sale? Oh, that would be Olivia. Olivia would just go hog wild. Um, I mean, I, I had a bunch of candles over there from the Bath and Body Works <laughs> sale. I also went hog wild. We're not going to talk about how much I spent on candles. Um, but no, I think Olivia would definitely be like, oh, I'm just going to go in and buy a couple. And then she'd be like, oh, but this one smells so good. Um, I can't choose. And, you know, so she would be like handing Margo candles and Margo would just be like, okay, like, <laughs> seriously, they smell the same to me. <laughs> that would be Olivia. Yeah, that is, that's just also me. So I just figured I would, I would ask, yeah, I went, I went <laughs> a little, a little bit wild, um, both online. And then I was like, you know what? maybe I should go into the store just to make sure that there's not one that I didn't actually know what it smelled like. And so I just, I should smell every single one in the store just to make sure. So I understand, I understand that. Which character would be most likely to spontaneously adopt a pet? Well, um, and not to be too spoilery for Count Your Lucky Stars, but um, Olivia, there, there's a cat. I mean, it's- it Plays an important role. It's a cover, so on the cover, so it's not really a spoiler. Um, cat is Olivia's cat and was an adopted cat. So um, hers was slightly spontaneous, but I do think that Elle would also, you know, she would see like some, some poor stray cat or dog and be like, Darcy, we have to, like, we can't just leave this cat like on the street. Um, so, so I think, Olivia has, I think, L would when given the opportunity. Yeah, I can see, I can see L like, oh, I'll just put out food for this one cat who comes nearby and then ends up having like 15 cats that come <laughs> that she feeds twice a day sort of thing. Yes. <laughs> I, can, I can definitely see that. Which character would be most likely to get into fights with strangers on social media? So my gut wants to say Margo. <laughs> But, but the thing is, so Elle and Margo run, you know, Oh My Stars, which is a successful social media astrology account. So I feel like when they probably first started out, Margo was probably very aggressive online and like angrily tweeting at people. But now I feel like Margo probably leaves a lot in the drafts. 
So she'll yeah. write something and just to get it out. And then she'll just like save it to drafts and like think about it in the morning. Um, but yeah, Margot, it would probably still, you know, slip through now and then. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's understandable. But yeah, you're right. I mean, with, with Oh My Stars, they, they're, she, she'd have to get used to letting idiots on the internet be idiots on the internet themselves and not, not engaging. So I understand that. <laughs> Which character would be most likely to become a plant queer or fill their home with plants? Ooh, um, that would be, that would definitely be Brendan and Annie both. Um, I think they would end up like collecting succulents. And just like, you know, be like, oh, it's cute. It's our little like in between, like, you know, inside joke thing. Um, if anyone's read Hang the Moon, there's a succulent joke between them. Um, so I think they would end up with like one succulent and then they would end up with like so many plants that it would be out of control. Um, so Brendan, Brendan and Annie both would like, Annie would probably fuel it and Brendan would be like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um. This one, I think this one is somewhat interesting since, you know, this is sort of a second chance for, for Marco and Olivia. So I don't know, I don't know how, how you may feel about it. Which character would be most likely to go to a high school reunion? Well, Margo would avoid high school reunions like the plague. She would, she has not gone, she would not go. She's like, no, that was in the past. Um, I think Olivia might've gone to like her 10 year, but beyond that she wouldn't um I would say you know maybe Elle I think Elle would want to show off her her hot girlfriend you know and be like see you all thought I was the weird kid in high school but now I run a successful social media empire and look where I am I understand that I thought I thought that maybe um you know not a spoiler because it's a romance there is a happily ever after here kids um, I thought maybe um, Olivia and Margot might want to show off each other um, once they go once together. They, yeah, go to ne- yeah, never yeah. on their own, but once once they sort of figure their stuff out, I yeah. thought maybe they want to go go show off. So yeah. okay, we have a, we have a lot of good uh, questions uh, from the audience still here. So okay. let me pop over there. Um, First off, we have from Darcy, we have any future plans to publish a fantasy novel or series? Ooh, um, fantasy. I, I, I don't know if I really have the world building in me for like pure fantasy. But I would definitely love to write a paranormal, like a paranormal mm. that's still grounded in like the contemporary world, but with those paranormal elements that's definitely something that I would love to write but you know pure fantasy probably not but never say never that no I like the idea that that paranormal but in the real world idea yeah real fantasy is too hard for me I think I (laughs) world building sounds tough I don't want to have to try (laughs) um and then Lacey says thank you for writing such beautiful queer stories um, and wants to know, did you always know you were going to be a writer or did you have an alternative career plan? Um, I think, you know, when I was, when I was younger, I wanted to be a writer. Um, it always seemed like a very far-fetched idea. Like how do, how do you actually write books? Um, how do you get them out into the world on shelves? I did not major in you know, creative writing in college. I majored in uh, human physiology with plans to go to medical school. Wow. And then I decided that I did not want that mountain of debt and um, responsibility of saving lives. <laughs> so I, you know, I did some, some kind of um, like computer science feasibility testing for a while. Um, so I kind of, I dabbled. I was kind of a jack of all trades for a little bit. Um, so it wasn't always my plan. No. Wow. Human physiology is not what I feel like I would have expected. I was yep. not ready for you to say that. So. <laughs> are you going to write a, are you going to write a doctor romance ever get a little bit back into that world? You know, I've thought about it. I, you know, I know a lot about human anatomy. I always make that joke. Like I know <laughs> all about every bone in the body and, um, but no, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe at some point. Yeah. Never say never. 
Haley S has what I think is a very difficult question, which is what songs would your character sing in karaoke? Oh, well, um, if you have read King the Moon, Brendan has, has done karaoke. He attempted to sing Annie's song by, um, of course, I'm blanking on the artist. Um, Annie's song by, it's on a playlist of mine, um, ended up uh, singing Annie Mae instead, rapping Annie Mae. <laughs> um, so that, that's, that was his, his go-to. Gosh. Was that always his go-to or was that specifically his go-to in that situation? He wanted to impress Annie with Annie's song, very romantic. And then there was a mix up and he ended up having to rap to Annie Mae. So definitely that wasn't his go-to. <laughs> that is tough. I will have to give the other one some thought and maybe answer that like in an IG story. I would, I would be surprised to see Marco do karaoke. I feel like. With some tequila in her, yeah. she would she would probably get up on stage um, and do some like very powerful rendition, um, but probably not sober. Yeah, that may, that that tracks actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long did it take for you to write the series total, like the whole, all three of them? Ooh, um, well, I, I sold the series in 2019, um, in August of 2019, um, I finished writing Written in the Stars in, um, I want to say November of 2019, um, revisions and all, and then I wrote Hang the Moon in early 2021, did some revisions. I draft very fast. I draft, well, in the past, I've drafted very fast, about a month to write the book. Wow, that is fast. <laughs> yeah, I normally, uh, drafting is my least favorite part. It causes me a lot of anxiety to have like that blank page. So I like to just get through drafting. Get everything out. <laughs> yeah, to get it out. Um, I'm trying to pace myself now so I don't burn out. So I'm Smart. like, I do like, you know, a thousand words a day, 500 words a day. Um, so Count Your Lucky Stars was written in about a month and a half. Wow. I write a good chunk of it um, in about another month and a half. Um, so I guess everyone can add that up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was kind of a, a whirlwind for me, but um, I, I do draft fast. Yeah, that's imp- I'm very impressed. I am not a fast drafter. So I am one of the people who has to be like, even one, even one word is better than no words. Just get, just get one on the page. It'll be, be yes. it'll be fine. I'm trying to adopt that method where I just like anything is better than nothing. Yeah. Um, a question. We only have a couple of questions left and it is just about time to, to be wrapping up here. So um, a couple more here we have for both of us, the question of, are your characters based on people, you know, in real life? You, you can take it first. Okay. Um, well, I, <laughs> Um, mistakes were made, which is my book, which comes out, uh, later this year in October. Um, I like to refer to as the MILF book, um, because it is about a college senior who has a one night stand with someone who ends up being one of her best friend's moms. Um, and so I just want to make it very clear that that's not based on anybody who I know in real life, um, on any side of it. Um, I, you know, I have a tendency to pull, I think, sort of traditions and, and some, you know, maybe even like, oh, a funny joke or, you know, a funny thing that someone said to me once, like little things like that, um, I'll I'll pull out from, from real life. Um, But the characters themselves are really aren't, aren't based on people I know in real life. Yeah, I agree. Same, same for me. No one's based off of anybody I know in real life, maybe some attributes, um, you know, yeah, if I hear over here, somebody say something funny, like in a coffee shop, not that I go to coffee shops these days. Anymore, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, normally it would be like if I heard something, it might like filter into my subconscious and I would incorporate it. Um, but no, nobody's based off of anybody I know, just purely my little brain, brain children. <laughs> It is, it is weird to have brain children, but then write romance, especially steamy romance to be like, oh, this yeah. is my child, but also this is what I'm writing them doing. Let's just, well, yeah, let's just not examine that. Yeah. My brain children are going to do some very tawdry things. <laughs> and then for our last question, I thought this was a fun one to say for last. Um, 
can you tell us the big three of each of the characters um, in the whole series? The main characters, obviously. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I will start with Margo and Olivia. So Margo is an Aries sun, Scorpio moon, Scorpio rising. Olivia is a Libra sun, Cancer moon, Leo rising. Uh, L is a Pisces sun, Scorpio moon, Pisces rising. Darcy is a Cancer, sun, uh, Capricorn sun, Cancer, no, Capricorn sun, Pisces moon, uh, Taurus rising. Brendan is an Aquarius sun. I want to say he's a Pisces moon, Sagittarius rising. Annie is a Sagittarius sun, Sagittarius moon, Aquarius rising. I think I might have Annie and Brendan's a little mixed up, but I have them all on my Instagram. <laughs> I am. You, you clearly must be a plotter because I am amazed that you can even remember that much. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of research into astrology and I have their birth charts planned out. Like I had them taped to my wall for a while. Wow. You really were with the strings. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was. I really was. I, I love that so much, but thank you so much for chatting with me. This oh, was, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. For this. this was a wonderful event. Um, everyone who's watching by the books, I actually gave my, didn't give lended my copy of, of written the stars away, but I have these two here now and you can, um, buy them from, um, yay, there it is. Um, from Parnassus there, there are signed book plates, right? Um, there are book plates, yes. so if you haven't already ordered it, order it today. Um, thank you all for coming and giving us such great questions. Uh, yes, thank you. And make sure that you pre-order Meryl's book. Also mistakes were made. Pre-order it now. Do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thank you, Parnassus, for, for having us. And yeah, we will see you on the other side. Thanks, everybody.